So I was pretty optimistic when I wrote that bio this spring, and I did not get in the field that much this year. It was, uh, it was an interesting transition year, um, spending most of my time in the office trying to keep everything running. Um, so I'll be talking about something a little bit different uh, than most of the talks here today. I was a little bit uh, unsure um, when I was originally contacted about presenting at this conference because it was really presented as trying to present uh, kind of success stories in consultation. And from my perspective, when it comes to archaeology and consultation, we're a long ways from success. Um, but we do have some success on the technical side of archaeology for the forestry sector. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about that, a little bit of context about what it is that we do as archaeologists working in the forestry sector, the results and what we've learned over the last uh, 20 years almost. A little bit about, and then I'll transition into how that kind of fits into consultation and some of the things that we've been trying to do and that I've personally been trying to do over the last five to ten years uh, to try to bridge that gap um, that I think needs to be bridged. And let's see. All right. So, so first off, um, what, is, uh, what is it that we do? Uh, when we talk about archaeology in Alberta, uh, archaeology is protected under the Historical Resources Act, and historic resources are actually really broadly defined. They include everything from, from uh, paleontological remains, uh, like this bison, this uh, bison antiquus or Ice Age bison horn core, to archaeological artifacts, uh, to historic buildings, um, and also culturally significant traditional use sites. And as an archaeologist, the way the forestry sector works a little bit differently than other industries, archaeologists are really the only boots on the ground in terms of historic resource professionals. And so we kind of have to keep an eye out for all of these things when we're in the field. So when I talk about archaeology, I'm really I'm speaking pretty broadly about heritage generally. Um, less so paleontology, we don't hit that much uh, in forestry, but archeo archaeological sites, historic buildings, and culturally significant traditional use sites are all the kinds of things that we keep an eye out for. Um, I do see some familiar faces here, and you're going to see some familiar slides, but I'm going to talk a little bit differently about them. Um, so in terms of the process of what we do, really briefly, uh, under the Historic Resources Management Program that's been set out for forestry, uh, every annual operating plan, and we're kind of transitioning to do it more at the forest harvest plan, uh, is reviewed by a professional archaeologist to make some recommendations about where historic sites and archaeological sites are likely to be. So we do a desktop screening, uh, then we submit that to the government. The government reviews our proposed methods, our research design, uh, and then issues us a permit to do our work. We go out in the field, ground truth our predictions, do some testing to see if we can find anything there, any material remains of past human activity. If we do, we'll, we'll test it out, figure out how big the site is, what it is, flag it off for avoidance. And then everything that we find comes back into the lab, gets analyzed, documented, and then submitted in a detailed report that goes to culture, Alberta Culture, uh, Multiculturalism, and Status of Women. And all the artifacts that we find end up at the Royal Alberta Museum. And so in theory, those are permanent records of everything that we do because uh, historic resources are considered uh, non-renewable resources, and even the sh little shovel tests that we dig are considered destructive testing. So the work we do is impacting the sites that we find, and so we have to submit a documented report of that, and then all of the artifacts are kept and are theoretically available for other people to study, analyze, interpret, um, or, just, or just take a look at if they, if they want to or need to. So that's, in a nutshell, that's everything I do. Um, so... When I started out working as a consulting archaeologist in 2002, um, this was the approximate state of the archaeological record in Alberta. Um, as you can see, uh, it's pretty heavily populated with archaeological sites in the plains. Um, that's where the, the home of archaeology in Alberta is in Calgary at the Glenbow Museum. And most of the first four decades of work, five decades of work, maybe even six, was focused on the plains. Work in the boreal forest was very limited up to a up to about 2,000. And when I started out working as a consultant and got my first job working for a company that primarily worked in the, in the forestry sector, it was kind of uh, considered not a really plum opportunity. Um, work in the boreal forest was considered really difficult, right? Long shifts, long days, remote locations, and everyone thought you're, just, you're not going to find anything. The prevailing wisdom at the time, archaeologically speaking, was that the boreal forest was uh, largely uninhabited in pre-contact times. 
that all the major sites were on the major lakes and rivers, um, and that the boreal hinterlands, uh, we weren't going to find anything there. There's no sites. And, and so that was kind of the, the mindset that I went into there with. Fortunately, I'm, I'm kinda, I was a bit of a glutton for punishment, maybe, and I liked the idea of going out and exploring. But some of this also tied into some of the, the misconceptions and myths that we had about, um, about pre-contact, uh, pre-fur trade life in North America. Uh, the idea of terra nullius, right, of empty land, was really prevalent even in the archaeological community. <clears throat> and so the idea that... Uh, that basically everything the fur traders and missionaries wrote down, right, that all, everyone just lived on the rivers, that that's all there was to know about the north. Um, I've read some interesting papers from the early 80s. I read one last fall that actually argued that the boreal forest might have been a significant barrier to people moving into North America um, because it's such an inhospitable landscape. And everyone here works or lives in the boreal forest and knows that it's not inhospitable, that it's not hard to live in. Right? And so this is a, a really good example of like, the initial failures in consultation in archaeology is that a lot of the early archaeologists coming out of the south and moving into the north didn't bother to ask communities up here, you know, where should we be looking for sites? Where, where have your ancestors and elders uh, lived and where have they used the landscape? So this is the, what I came into. Um, move ahead about 20 years, and we've got a very different picture of what uh, life uh, before the present in northern Alberta looked like. All of the blue triangles on here were found under forestry historic resource imp impact assessments. And the red is everything else going on in the boreal forest. You can see here, well, you can, it's tough to make out those numbers, but forestry has found more sites uh, than the oil sands, um, has contributed more to our understanding of most of northern Alberta than the oil sands. And there's a number of things that have contributed to this, and this is the success story that I want to tell before I move on to some of the challenges and the work that we have yet to do. So starting in you know, the early 2000s, we got out there and just slogging through the bush, looking for good places to camp, high dry ground, close to water, digging shovel tests, and every once in a while we would find something. But that slow, steady progression, accumulation of knowledge helped tell us um, where we should be looking for archaeological sites and made it easier to find the next one. And from about 2000 to 2010, it was that slow, steady progression. I remember being really excited when I'd go out for a 10-day shift and we'd find more than one or two sites. Starting again, and I'll, I'll mention it again, we could have asked people where to go and where to look, but, but we, we didn't, right? Um, in about 2010, we started getting access to LIDAR data, and that made a, a, a sea change difference. Once we got that LIDAR data, like the rest of you, we could see the entire landscape. We could look at those bare earth hillshades, and we could see all the landforms that we were missing because we were walking 60 meters away from them and couldn't see them for the trees. And then we were able to more, better target our surveys and spend more time looking at places that are likely to have sites. And our site returns started going up. First they doubled, and then they went up by 5x, and then they went up by 10x, to the point where uh, currently, it's a kind of a, it's a bad shift if we go out into the field and don't find a site almost every day. So we've made huge strides on the technical side of how to uh, predict and find and protect historic resource sites. Uh, we're out there finding, the forestry sector is finding probably close to 200 new, newly recorded, at least to the government and to archaeologists, uh, archaeological and historic sites every year. And some of those are getting to be pretty, pretty interesting. We're also challenging the preconceived notions that um, even the sites that you can find in the boreal forest, I hear this all the time from Calgary archaeologists, right? Even the sites you find up there, like why bother even finding them? It's just a handful of stone flakes. There's nothing to learn. There's no organic preservation. There's no bison kills up there, right? So we're starting to though find, because we're getting uh, enough sites, that we're starting to find some really interesting finds. We're getting the occasional site with bone in it, and radiocarbon dating has proceeded to the point where a piece of bone the size of, uh, animal bone, the size of a pencil eraser is enough to get a solid radiocarbon date and figure out exactly when people were living at a site. Uh, we're finding mo a lot more diagnostic tools. Um, things like this 4,500-year-old oxbow spear point, uh, that was found on uh, the Peace River Trail between Athabasca and Slave Lake. Um, this stone knife that might be 8,000 years old, um, based on the shape of it and style, because these things changed through time. Uh, but it, we still have a lot left to learn. Um, 
one of the challenges of forestry archaeology is that when we find sites, uh, we typically just test them out, figure out how big they are, and walk away. Um, so we don't really understand them, but the advantage of that is that the vast majority of sites found by the forestry sector are left intact and protected in place. So yeah, the sites that we find, I mentioned lots of scatters of stone flakes and chips, um, the occasional artif uh, formed artifact or tool, right? There's always, anytime we're finding these, there are probably tools present, but again, we're not doing enough work. But we also find more recent signs of, of human activity in the forest. We find things like culturally modified trees, like this uh, stripped birch tree with significant healing lobes. It's probably mid 20th century and lots of historic cabins. And so moving on from, um, from kind of the success of how we've gotten really good at finding and protecting these sites to why this matters to consultation is that 99% of what we're finding is indigenous history. And I've talked a little bit with a couple of people today. And as an archaeologist coming out of university 20 years ago, um, we really came out with this idea of, you know, the shared heritage of humankind, which is a great way to say it's the shared heritage of humankind, but us, we're trained archaeologists, and so it's our job to, and it's our privilege, right, to control it and protect it. And that's something that's got to change, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this, because this is indigenous heritage. Um, and we should be... Uh, bridging that gap between First Nation communities and archaeology and, and talking about it more. A little anecdote that I wanted to share just to drive this home is we found a cabin, not this one, but a similar trapping cabin. Um, and trapping cabins are really common. You guys have all seen them out there. Uh, but every one of those has an interesting story behind it. We found one a couple of years ago in the Swan Hills. And in the, the historic debris that was around it uh, was a can that still had some identifiable markings on it. And we got it home, and we managed to look those up and find some, uh, some more information about them. And it turned out that it was, um, was baby formula, right? And it really drove home the fact that our preconceived notions about what these sites are isn't always accurate or is mostly inaccurate, right? These aren't just trapping cabins, right? These were homes. And they weren't just places where people were participating in economic activity under the trap line system. They were places where people were living, and they had their families and their, their children. So that's kind of the context, uh, the success story of archaeology. Um, I'm moving through this pretty quickly. If anybody has any questions, please do uh, put your hand up, or I can talk about them later. Um, but moving on then to the more interesting, I think, part is kind of where we're at now and what the challenges are going forward. So I called this bridging the gap, um, and this, this is the gap here. We have this weird relationship when we're talking about heritage management for the forestry sector. I guess it's not, it's just the way it works, right? We're contractors working for the FMA holder. The FMA holder is engaged with the First Nations in consultation, um, but there's this, this communication gap between us. Um, <clears throat> and I see there are three main areas, I think, that we can work to, to try to bridge this gap. The first is informal consultation, like formal regulatory communications. The second is an improved engagement, and the third is an improved participation. And I'll talk a little bit now about my experiences uh, in each of those areas, and some of what I've learned, some of what, some of what hasn't worked, and some ideas for how we might be able to move forward, um, because that's really what I want to hear. I'm hoping to get some ideas, or at least plant the seeds of some ideas, um, to figure out how we can move forward and start working on better relationships. So first off, talking about consultation and some of my experiences engaging in that. Um, I've been involved a little bit on both sides of consultation. Uh, working for industry, I've done impact assessments that are then um, used as part of the development approval process. And one of the things that we've tried to do to help with consultation there is generate non-technical summaries. Um, because I know that the two to 300 page reports that we write for the Heritage Management Branch, none of you are reading them. And most archaeologists aren't reading them either, right? They're a formal technical document. And trying to narrow that, to summarize that into something that's intelligible and understandable um, is something we've gotten some good feedback from some of our clients that taking that into their GDP consultation meetings to demonstrate the work that they're doing to try to balance heritage values and timber values on the landscape is something that, uh, that might help. Um, on the other side, I've also worked on technical reviews of impact assessment reports for First Nations. And again, there, I'm, 
one of the big challenges that we have in consultation, and part of the reason this gap is so wide, is there is a big difference, and it's come up already this morning, in availability of technical expertise, right, and and just the 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 capacity uh, to work with the data that's being generated, and the access to the the archaeological information we're generating. And so, doing those technical reviews is a way to help First Nations bridge that gap. Um, but only, you know, not every First Nation has the funding capacity uh, to support that kind of work. Um, another issue with that kind of work is that it's kind of playing into this adversarial consultation mechanism or process that's already come up this morning. And so, so while I think it's really important uh, that that be done um, and that that expertise be available to First Nations as well as to industry, the, the current consultation mechanism uh, is, I think, fraught with with these challenges and, and sets up this, this uh, oppositional relationship. So consultation, I don't think there's a whole lot that anyone, well, actually I shouldn't say anyone because there's a lot of government people here, but there's not a whole lot that First Nations, archeologists and industry can, can do to really fix the consultation process. And one last message I'll say is like, the bridge, the only bridge I see right here, and this is what we'll move on to, is that the FMA holder, the foresters in this room, are the ones that are going to have to bridge this gap on the consultation side. So moving on to something that I think has a lot more potential to help improve two-way communication and start bridging that gap is uh, less formal engagement. And I, we hear the word engagement a lot, and it's basically that building the relationships. Um, we've made a lot of experiments with engagement. Um, most of these we've done as, as tree time or as individuals, um, trying to build some relationships and share some knowledge on our own outside of uh, specific projects. Um, because one of the other things, one of the other experiences that I've had in consultation is that trying to bridge that gap myself uh, kind of proactively has backfired uh, pretty significantly in a couple of instances. Um, sharing information, puts you in a, can put me in a very, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to keep this talk a little more personal than usual, but sharing that information can put me in a tough position between my client and the First Nation, right? So, so in, these, in most of the cases that I'm talking about, most of the methods that we've tried to use to share information have been kind of separated from the specific projects that we're doing and talking more generally about archaeology in a region or in a traditional territory and, and trying to share that information. But I think there's a big opportunity here uh, to use these kinds of methods and mechanisms to, to foster better communication and to better communicate the, the good work that's being done. So some of the things that we've done, um, we've done a lot of school visits and just general public visits, uh, sharing the results of the, the work that we do. Um, and the feedback is, has always been really good. The, the general feedback that we get from, from kids think this stuff is really cool. And especially um, kids, this is up in Gruard. And so kids, uh, indigenous kids, think it's really cool that somebody comes up from Edmonton who thinks that their history is really cool. Another thing that we've done is uh, public engagement type events. Uh, we called it the Archaeology Roadshow. And we've been, we go to museums. We've gone, gone to several public events. One of the ones that I thought was most successful was this one here, where we actually set up a stones and bones table with artifacts and some posters and information about the work we'd been doing at the High Prairie Gun Show. And you wouldn't have thought, but that's, that's a great place to meet a whole lot of people. Um, and for a whole lot of people to get exposed to the fact that there's these cool historical stories in their backyard um, that they had never heard about. Going back to that idea of terra nullius, one of the things that I've heard in the High Prairie Slave Lake region, there's a really common myth up there that that entire region was completely uh, uninhabited prior to the fur trade. And so we've gone up there, and I've, I've had this conversation with people up there who, who say, oh, well, I heard that, you know, that all of the natives up here descended from Iroquois freemen that came in with the fur trade, and there was nobody here before that, right? And those are the kinds of myths. Those are the kinds of, of stories that we're, that we're trying to counter and that we kind of grew up with, that idea of empty land. Um, and that's one that came up at, at these events, at events at High Prairie and Slave Lake. And so I think there's a lot of work that we can all do to try to show that the, the land has been occupied, all, all aspects of it, for, uh, since time immemorial. Um, 
And yeah, some, these are a few more examples. Some other stuff that we've done is uh, we've a blog and a Facebook. And that actually, Facebook has been one of the ways that we've really started building some connections with indigenous communities in Northern Alberta in the areas that we work. Because again, we're just sharing stories about the history of the places that they live. Nobody in Wabasca had ever heard about archeological sites around Wabasca, right, before. And, and the fact that, that we're doing that and sharing it um, is very interesting to people. So the last area that I think we can all work on is participation, um, economic participation, as well as uh, just participating in, in the process. So historically, there was actually a workshop this spring. Uh, the Culture and Tourism put on an, an, a workshop, drew in all of the archaeologists in the province to talk about our experiences with Indigenous engagement. And we all shared really similar stories. The traditional model of, of Indigenous participation in archaeology in Alberta and throughout North America is largely excavations uh, where you have a big crew, a long-term project, and you provide opportunities for people to come in and dig for a while, right? Be an archaeologist for a day or for a week. Another really common model is training programs, um, but one of the, the issues with both of these is that they're, they're kind of token participation. There's no path towards, uh, towards employment or towards a career or professionalization. So we, we experimented with both of these. We experimented with uh, working with First Nations and, and calling consultation units to see if anybody was available to come out with us. Um, but with the planning horizons that we had and the workloads that we had, it's, it's really tough uh, to, to try to organize that. <clears throat> so this year, we actually tried a new model. We entered into an agreement with Paul First Nation. And part of that agreement was a commitment on our part that we were going to do our best to recruit a couple people through their community to work full time as tree time employees, right? So not, one of the reasons that this worked so far, and, and it did, we managed to recruit a couple of really good people who've worked the entire season with us, uh, learned a lot and wanna come back next year and, and we're excited to have them back next year. And one of the reasons that this worked is that we all acknowledge the problem with that, that temp labor kind of model, that it wasn't a good model for archeology span and it's not a good model for anybody. Nobody was getting what they wanted out of it. Um, people, the, the people who actually might want a career in archaeology aren't getting an opportunity to access that. And the archaeology also is, is suffering because we're constantly bringing on kind of new inexperienced workers. Um, and that's, that either drives up costs, which uh, decreases the desire of industry to do archaeology, or it uh, affects the quality of the archaeological work that's being done if you're constantly retraining new people. So this model has worked pretty well uh, for us. But it's not going to work for everybody. More remote locations, it's going to be more challenging. And, and smaller communities, it's going to be more challenging. Um, <clears throat> so, but I bring this up because I think in order to improve the situation here and try to bridge the gap, I think we are going to have to change our business models. We're, the old models that we've been trying over and over and over uh, haven't been working. And we're, we're going to have to try some new things. And some of them are going to work and some aren't. And I don't have a solid conclusion for this talk because um, it's a work in progress. But I think some of the things that we have heard about this morning are going to come up again, uh, that we're going to have to work on building those relationships. We're going to have to get over some of the, the issues, uh, the history, and we're going to have to get real about the history and admit that we made a lot of mistakes in the past and that our predecessors made a lot of mistakes in the past. Um, and, and hopefully try to work on coming together in ways that we can, we can share the land, share the resources, and share our heritage and some of the shared stories that we have in the ground. Mm -hmm.